Hey, hi to you both. Hi. Hey, Edwin. I'm Edwin. Hey, nice to meet you. Edwin, I have to tell you, I have been looking forward to this presentation for quite some time. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Because I think I we- cat, I see your cat's interested too. Oh yeah, don't <laughs> mind him. <laughs> well, I'm down in the basement so that my dogs, because they periodically sound off and it, you know it's an incredible distraction. <laughs> As dogs do, right? Yes, exactly. And well, actually, our cat does it almost as badly as our dogs. He's just not as not quite as loud, but so he's think, very vocal. I think Lander won't mind me sharing this, but we have this running like side reel of like our cats asking to be fed during these presentations, <laughs> and it happens pretty <laughs> frequently to the two of us. Um, <laughs> I think Lander, <laughs> am I correct in saying you've gone as far as like just feed them ahead of time so they <laughs> didn't bother you? <laughs> yes, tonight I did that. I just literally just fed them. So I'm hoping they won't bother me. Sometimes I go into a room and close the door so that they can't bother me. <laughs> we'll see so what happens. They, in a they, they have you very well trained. Uh, they do. Basically, Absolutely. yeah. Yep. I'm actually, I should consider myself lucky to even be in this room because this is our guest room slash the cat's room. So he stakes <laughs> out here all day. And now in the time of COVID, it has become my, my home office. So I have to give him credit where it's due. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, all right. Well, I mean, I think I, lo I logged on a little late, but I have four o'clock already. Me too. Should we get started? All right. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to another Friends from the Field webinar. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself in the chat box, please feel free to do that. It's always fun to see who's out there in our virtual community, even though we can't see your faces. Um, if you'd like to say where you're from and if you have any particular reason that you're attending tonight and want to share that, um, please feel free. If this is your first time attending a Friends from the Field webinar, this is a series that is co-hosted by Blue Hill Heritage Trust, which is a community conservation organization for the Blue Hill Peninsula, and in which um, I'm the outreach coordinator, my name's Lander, and um, also between Island Heritage Trust, which is a land trust for Deer Isle, Stonington, and the surrounding islands, and Jake is here with us from Island Heritage Trust. <clears throat> so I'm going to introduce our speaker in just a moment, but I'm going to pass it over to Jake for some technology housekeeping first. Thank you, Lander. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. We're so excited to have you. Uh, just two points of technical housekeeping for you. Uh, please, like Lander said, feel free to use the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you have questions for Edwin, you can certainly drop them in the chat box throughout the presentation. But we will save the questions for the end of the presentation. We'll have a Q&A with Edwin. And at that point, if you'd like to util utilize the raise your hand feature, you can actually ask your question yourself with your own audio. And that is at the bottom of your, it should be at the bottom of your screen as well. And it's its own little button. And uh, don't feel bad if you press it by accident, it happens almost every time, so. All right, with that, that's my short bit. I'll hand it back over to Lander for our formal introduction. Awesome, thank you, Jake. And thank you all for um, starting to put <clears throat> comments in the chat box. I can see those coming in and that'll be fun to read. Um, so we're really excited to have Edwin Barkdahl. Did I pronounce your last name right? You got it. Awesome. Here with us tonight, he is a Maine Master Naturalist and an incredible wildlife and nature photographer. Um, and he's gonna be talking to us about pond life in winter and moving into spring as well. So thank you so much, Edwin, for being here with us. And I'm gonna pass it over to you. Well, thank you both. Uh, I'm gonna actually stop my video of me to get myself kind of out of the scene. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, so welcome to this talk on pond life under the ice from winter to spring. And let me start sharing my screen with you guys. Do I, is there a thumbs up from somebody to, you got, you're seeing something? Okay. Uh, and uh, thanks to the Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Island Heritage Trust for hosting and to the Maine Master of Naturalist program, which was the inspiration for the presentation tonight. And uh, the past year seemed like it would never end. So I find the fact that Yet another spring is on the horizon 
is kind of comforting. Uh, for us winter lovers, uh, at first this year seemed destined to give us not very much snow and not very much ice to explore. Uh, but fortunately, the past few weeks or so produced some good ice. And this was actually probably a month ago by now. Uh, and so I hope that you have been able to get out and enjoy it. Tonight, I'll be talking about animals ranging from tiny, unfamiliar invertebrates to the larger, more familiar vertebrates like the charismatic salamanders and frogs who come out during the spring amphibian migration. And but for the fact that life under the ice is so interesting by itself, one might consider this talk as a teaser for that migration at ice breakup come spring. In fact, that night is a little over a month away, so mark it on your calendars. Uh, as an aside, this annual migration is one of those amazing events that's easy to miss if you aren't looking for it. Why? Well, it typically occurs on wet nights in early April when the temperature is a little above 40 degrees, not conditions drawing most people out of their warm homes to go exploring. But if you're listening to this talk, you're probably not most people and might be tempted to get out of your comfort zone and into a wet April night. And if you are, it is well worth it. But I'm getting ahead of our story, which begins back in February, when the pond is still ice locked and players in the amphibian drama are still dreaming of their big night. First, a few comments about some of the animals you'll see tonight. There are eight native species of salamander in Maine, of which we'll see three tonight, the Eastern Newt, the Spotted, and the Blue Spotted Salamanders. They may be the longest living of the animals at the pond, with a spotted salamander reportedly living uh, up to an astounding 32 years, although 15 to 20 years is more typical in the wild. So if you frequent a, a pond that uh, spotted salamanders frequent year after year, you, you probably are seeing some of the same salamanders. Now salamanders don't call like the frogs do and so are less often encountered unless you're actually looking for them. Frogs are way more dramatic with characteristic and often loud calls. Uh, in fact, we've had guests who are not accustomed to the night sounds around our house complain of having a hard time sleeping because of the loud spring peepers. Now there are eight frog species in Maine, including five who appear at our pond. The wood frog, the spring peeper, the gray tree frog, the bullfrog, and the green frog. And the video I'll be showing now was primarily shot at a small pond in Surrey. This video is about pond life in winter's icy grip and its resurgence in spring. Because of the great diversity of pond life, I will only scratch the surface of the tip of the iceberg and offer more an appreciation of what happens as winter gives way to spring rather than an attempt at an exhaustive description. I hope you will see that many of these animals are fascinating and beautiful as well. In Maine, winter is a time when we bundle up to stay warm and enjoy the warmth from a fireplace or a hot drink. Wildlife don't have these luxuries and pond life seemed to me to be particularly subject to the harsh environment that winter brings. If you're anything like me, you might have thought that as winter deepens, pond life would enter a dormant phase under the frozen surface, just waiting for spring to start a renewal cycle. After all, the water temperature is near freezing and all the pond life I will be talking about is cold blooded. So in early February, I cut a two by four foot hole in the ice of a small main pond to see for myself. The air temperature that morning was 20 degrees Fahrenheit and the ice was eight inches thick. The temperature of the water below the ice was 34 degrees Fahrenheit, which protected any aquatic life from the much colder temperature above the ice. I expected that if I were lucky, I might find a hibernating amphibian if I searched hard enough. Imagine my surprise to discover that life under the ice is actually quite active all the way up the food chain. The first animals I encountered below the ice were swarming microinvertebrates, particularly tiny cyclops and daphnia, which serve as critical food for animals higher on the food chain. Cyclops are tiny crustaceans that generally live in slow moving or still fresh water like this pond. They primarily eat smaller organisms and plant material. This cyclops is smaller than two millimeters or a 10th of an inch long. Its movements alternate between slow drifting 
in rapid jumps propelled by its pair of long antennae, which are also used in mating. You can see the motion of the antennae as the cyclops propels itself forward in the slow motion second half of the clip. Cyclops' smaller legs are a blur of motion in the video and are used primarily to collect minute food items. You can see more details of Cyclops in the microscope image. The Cyclops has a single eye, just like the monster of Greek mythology, indicated by the upper arrow. Furthermore, she is a female, as can be seen by the sack of eggs she carries. Another common microinvertebrate, the water flea, or Daphnia, is also a small freshwater crustacean that, similarly to Cyclops, uses the rhythmic beating of their many small legs to capture tiny food items. Their large antenna are used to swim in a jerky motion as seen in the video, as this Daphnia swims over the back of a salamander larva. Most Daphnia throughout the year are female, as in this microscope image, which also shows the Daphnia's antennae and single eye. This particularly female is not carrying any eggs at this time, but would ordinarily carry them in her ovary under her back. In addition to the nearly microscopic cyclops and daphnia, there are many macroinvertebrates under the ice that are considerably larger than cyclops and daphnia and can range from roughly half an inch to several inches long. I will focus only on a few kinds of insect. As you can see from the next few photos of the pond bottom, there is no shortage of these insects as they rest partially camouflaged on the bottom. Each view is about a foot across and there are red lines around each insect that I see or about 10 to 20 per square foot of pond bottom. That's a lot of bugs. I wouldn't be surprised if I missed a few. When I first began looking under the ice, the most abundant macroinvertebrates were various species of caddisfly larvae. Caddisfly larvae are common in slow moving or still water like streams or ponds and can be found slowly crawling on submerged rocks or plants or other material under the water. You may have seen them yourself and thought they were simply a small stick or bundle of twigs or clumps of sand in the water. The larvae can often be distinguished by the types of intricate shelters they build, characteristic head colors and patterns, as well as other features. Caddisfly larvae metamorphose in the spring into adult flying insects, similar in appearance to moths and butterflies. One of my favorites is in the Phrygonaeidae family from the Greek for dry sticks, which builds a two to three inch long spiraling cylindrical home out of plant material. If you look closely, you will see its striking yellow and black head emerging from one end. They were quite common and active despite a water temperature of about 34 degrees Fahrenheit. They move slowly and purposefully, as can be seen in this 10 times sped up video of a Phrygonaid larva and salamander larva. Both larvae seem to have their own mission as they crawl across the pond bottom. These caddisfly larvae are omnivores eating plant and animal material often the form of organic matter or detritus that accumulates on the bottom of the pond. This short video shows a Phrygonaid larva foraging in the mud of the pond bottom. Well, foraging or just having a blast romping through the mud. Some Phrygonaids use small twigs or plant parts to build homes which look like tiny crude brooms. On the left of the photo, you can see the larva's yellow and black head peering out of its tube home. Other caddisfly larvae build bristly twiggy log cabins. Notice the difference in head coloration and patterning of this larva. Rather than the striking yellow and black, it sports a much less gaudy brown head with dark spots. Caddisfly larvae are very adept on nearly any surface and can be found as they leisurely crawl foraging on the pond bottom along underwater plants. over each other, and even on the underside of the pond's frozen ice surface. Remarkably, some caddisfly larvae can survive being frozen in ice, as with this larva I found and slowly thawed. First, you see a photo of the larva still embedded in ice. Following this is a clip of the thawed larva. 
I like to think it's waving with gratitude at being freed from its frozen confines. In addition to foraging on the bottom for food, caddisfly larvae can be aggressive predators and can be seen here preying upon wood frog eggs, just one of the many reasons I'm glad I'm not a frog living in a pond, and even on other caddisfly larvae. In the first clip, the limnephalid larva has grabbed onto the end of a phryganeid larva's tube house. In the second clip, three phryganeid larvae are wrestling together. I can't be sure what they're doing, but it doesn't look like a reunion of long lost friends. Other common macroinvertebrates under the ice include the similar bugs, water boatmen, and back swimmers, which can be comparably sized at about a half an inch in length. The quickest way to tell which is which is whether it is swimming on its back. If yes, it's generally a back swimmer. Otherwise, it's probably a water boatman. Also, if you're able to get a good look at their undersides, the water boatman's rear two pairs of legs are large and used for swimming, while only the back swimmer's single rear pair of legs is enlarged. Unlike the water boatmen, which generally eat only plant material, back swimmers are carnivores and eat other small animals in the pond and can apparently deliver a painful bite to a person who is not careful with them. So far, I've avoided that fate. You can also see whirligig beetles in the family Gyrinidae under the ice, little black watermelon seed shaped beetles. Perhaps you've been entranced by them as they scurry haphazardly on the water surface in the summer, but under the ice, they swim more slowly or crawl on the underside of the ice as they scavenge food or prey upon other pond life. And I particularly like the bristly mustache this one is sporting. Whirligig beetles have a few interesting characteristics, including an air bubble they carry, which allows them to stay underwater for a very long time without coming to the surface almost like a scuba diver with an air tank. Additionally, each of their eyes have distinct parts, which are designed to allow them to see simultaneously under and above the water. It is almost as though they have four eyes, a pair for looking above the water and a pair for looking below the water at the same time, a very handy adaptation for an animal that lives on the surface at the interface between air and water. Because whirligig beetles live mostly on the water surface, it's not surprising that they are sensitive to anything that disturbs the water surface, even if that is just loud sounds. Here's a short video of whirligig beetles responding to the sounds of my wife, Zoe, and one of our dogs barking. Watch for the circles which appear on the water. Those are the beetles scurrying around. Bow! 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 Leeches also made regular appearances under the ice. Despite their undeserved reputation as evil bloodsuckers, not all leeches are bloodsuckers. Many are predatory, eating mosquito larvae and other smaller invertebrates. From the very first day I looked under the ice, I saw vertebrate animals, larval salamanders, bullfrog tadpoles, and adult eastern newts. They were much less common than the invertebrates, but were still regular visitors. Spotted salamanders lay eggs in the spring with some of the larvae maturing to adults after a single summer and others overwintering on the bottom before becoming adults in their second summer. The larvae are one to one and a half inches long and they sport feathery gills around their neck, enabling them to breathe underwater, which they lose when they become adults. Lest you be lulled by their appearance into thinking that they are simply slow moving cute animals, know that they are predators, primarily eating smaller animals, such as the cyclops that they snap up in this video. And I've slowed down the salamander's snap to let you see just how quick it can be. Just like spotted salamander larvae, some bullfrog and green frog tadpoles overwinter as well. However, unlike the salamander larvae and the adult bullfrogs and green frogs, the tadpoles are strict herbivores eating plant material like algae.
One of the first vertebrates I saw under the ice was an adult Eastern newt on February 10th. The adult is an olive colored salamander with small reddish spots on its back and a light colored belly. The adults have been found to play an important role as predators eating a variety of invertebrates such as mosquito larvae and other vertebrate eggs and larvae. And this last slide shows a pregnant Eastern newt at the end of March in preparation for ice breakup and breeding. Ice breakup on the pond was particularly memorable for me as I fell through the thin ice while photographing in early April. April 10th, two days after my icy mishap, I heard the first wood fog mating calls, which I likened to the sound of arguing gnomes. The timing is not a coincidence. If the animals try to get a jump on their competition to find a mate and migrate too soon, they may get to their pond and find it still covered in ice, preventing them from entering the water and breeding. If they really want to play it safe and wait until it's even warmer, they may get to the pond and find that all the available mates are already breeding. So timing is everything. Wood frogs are among the smaller frogs in the pond, usually no more than two to three inches, excluding the legs, with a dark brown facial mask against a lighter brown body. Wood frogs don't waste any time in long courtships after emerging from hibernation and migrating to the pond. As I observed mating and egg laying two days later on April 12th, and then silence within a week. As you can see in the following photographs, breeding, also called amplexus, can occur on the surface or while submerged. As an aside to any male wood frogs watching this video and feeling secure that you have found a mate, as in this photo, don't be overconfident as other males in the neighborhood will be happy to try to break up your relationship. Within a few seconds, a second male appeared on the left and aggressively tried to push the male on the right away from the female. After a brief scuffle, the male on the right managed to repel the attack but we'll have to remain vigilant. Three is definitely a crowd when it comes to frog love. Typically eggs are laid attached to underwater vegetation in large masses as can be seen with the female wood frog in this photograph. After being laid, a gel surrounding the eggs absorbs water to form the familiar egg masses enclosing the little black and white eggs which soon change to all black or dark brown. Note that unlike the spotted salamander egg masses we will see, the wood frog egg masses lack a jelly capsule which surrounds the entire egg mass. Within 24 hours, the eggs are already dividing into tiny soccer balls. And they're on their way to becoming a tiny tadpole no more than a quarter of an inch long 16 to 20 days later. Adult spotted salamanders are large, handsome amphibians with bright yellow spots along their bodies. They made their silent but dramatic appearance on April 12th as they migrated from their winter sanctuaries in the woods to the pond, forming large, swirling congregations of salamanders performing mating dances. The males deposit packets of sperm called spermatophores on the pond bottom, which are then picked up by females, who lay their egg masses about two days later on underwater plants, twigs, and branches, as you can see with this female on a plant stem. Just like the frog egg mass, which rapidly absorbs water, so do salamander eggs, producing the large egg mass seen here. The arrow indicates the large gel capsule which surrounds the egg mass and which the frogs lack. So if you find an egg mass with a large capsule, you immediately know it was laid by a salamander and not a frog. The incubation period for the spotted salamander eggs is considerably longer than that of the wood frog and can be as long as one to two months. Some of the salamander eggs you may find will have a greenish hue. This is due to the presence of algae inside the eggs, which form a rare symbiotic relationship between a vertebrate host, the salamander, and another organism, the alga, within the cells of the host. One theory is that the algae provide increased oxygen to the developing salamander embryos. Unlike the larval salamanders, which breathe underwater using their feathery gills, adult salamanders need to breathe air. You can see them 
as they make a beeline from the bottom of the pond to the surface to gulp air. The blue spotted salamander was much less common than its cousin, the spotted salamander, with a single blue spotted adult appearing on April 16th. It is smaller, three to six inches long compared to the five to 10 inch spotted salamander and features small blue speckles against the dark blue black background of its skin. For their size, they're the smallest frog at this pond measuring less than one and a half inches long. Spring peepers can produce a lot of sound. If all the spring frogs formed a rock band, peepers would be the lead guitars. Being in the midst of a full evening chorus of peepers is exhilarating, but can be nearly deafening at the same time. They often have an X-like pattern on their backs. However, their most salient feature is their call as it can take some practice to find them hiding in the grass or on twigs, but it is easy to hear them calling from a long distance away. Male peepers began calling in earnest around April 15th, and unlike the wood frogs who fell silent after a week of frenzied activity, continued calling loudly for at least two months. Apparently comfort is not the most important factor when it comes to peeper love, as this male is perched on the thorny stem of a wild rose bush. And after all the calling and perching on thorns, if you're a lucky peeper, you will find a mate in the water or on the land. Spring peeper eggs are laid singly in small clusters or in lines on underwater stems or vegetation, often hidden under leaves on the pond bottom. Three final species of frog stage spring entrances in this pond. Perhaps the most charismatic is the gray tree frog, which begins its evening calling in earnest in mid-May and can be found perched as high as five or six feet in bushes and trees during the breeding season. Gray tree frogs are unusual in that they can change their coloration, not unlike a chameleon, to match the color of the surface they sit on. The male's call is a rapid trill, which can be heard in the woods as well as on the pond's edge, starting in the early evening and reaching a crescendo in the middle of the night. Like the other frog species at this pond, the adults are carnivorous, eating insects, spiders, and snails primarily. The call of the green frog has been likened to the sound of a plucked banjo string, and you can hear its call in this video with a background of chorusing gray tree frog trills. At our pond, the green and bull frogs don't call in as large choruses as the spring peepers, wood frogs, and gray tree frogs, rather tending to prefer solos, duets, or trios as they pluck their banjo strings or call their deep songs. Just as the bullfrog and green frog tadpoles can be confused, so can the adults, but for prominent ridges on the backs of green frogs called dorsolateral folds. In the green frog, the folds extend from behind the eyes along nearly the entire length of the back, while in the bullfrog, they terminate abruptly in a downward curve behind the eardrum. In addition, female green frogs and female bullfrogs can be differentiated from males by comparing the size of their eyes to their eardrums. If the eardrum is about the same size as the eye, it is a female. If it's larger, it's a male. It's very nice when the animals are so helpful in aiding our identification of them. If the spring peepers lead guitar at our pond, bullfrogs are the kings and queens, as you can see in this photo of a king bullfrog ruling his small pond. Bullfrogs are aggressive predators eating virtually anything they can fit in their mouths from invertebrates like water beetles and dragonflies to vertebrates like small snakes, mice, and even other frogs. They're the largest frogs in our pond reaching up to nearly eight inches in length with even some of the older tadpoles being several inches long. Their call is a deep resonant baritone which can be heard from a long distance as the males stake out their territory. Earlier, I mentioned the food chain at the pond. However, in reality, nature is not so orderly and is better described as a food web of interconnectedness. While taking some videos and photos of frogs, I noticed tiny mosquitoes having a meal at the frog's expense. And to close the circle from the small to the large and back again at this pond, here are a few photos of mosquitoes biting a spring peeper 
a green frog and yes, even the king of our pond, a bullfrog. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope even more that it will spark interest in and desire to explore the amazing world around us. This was just shot at a pond in our backyard and offers only a tiny glimpse of the wonder around us that may be just around the corner on a log, up a tree, or under the ice. All right, so uh, we've had some salamander dancing, frog serenading, late night romancing, egg laying, babies hatching. And they're just a few, few of the highlights of the, the uh, amphibian love fest. And to quote Julie Andrews in The Sound of Music, these are a few of my favorite things, honestly. But I will spare you all by not breaking into song. But life doesn't stop after their big night. Rather, the drama continues. And these are a few freshly hatched spotted salamander larvae, and they are pretty adorable. You can see the difference between these uh, latter two uh, larvae and this one, which under, uh, overwintered under the ice. And it's a much a duller brown color than the two previous more golden colored ones are. And uh, as a rule, identifying the different species of larval salamanders is pretty challenging. Uh, but there are some guides out there to help if you're uh, interested in pursuing that. So all in all, life is pretty good, yes? Well, not so fast. They aren't the only things hatching. And some of the other things are predators. Most of the other animals in this slide are predaceous diving beetle larvae, also called water tigers. And they would like nothing better than to make a meal of a salamander larva or a tadpole. I have to admit, I'm rooting for the amphibians here, but I don't think the odds are in their favor. Uh, you can see uh, there are two different species of predaceous diving beetle larvae here. One is the larger one that's out of focus in the upper left, and we'll see a better shot of this one later. And the smaller, more cigar-shaped one, which is shown uh, in a close-up here. And you can start to see the impressive jaws on the right-hand side that these guys use to catch their prey. And this is a close-up of the larger one. And honestly, it really just reminds me of a monster out of a B-grade horror movie from the 50s. And this is a close-up of the business end, uh, and it uses these jaws, which are actually hollow, uh, and to latch onto its prey, it injects a digestive enzyme and it basically dissolves its prey from the inside out. It, it really is a featured, should be featured in a horror movie. And here is one, preying upon a wood frog a tadpole and alas, a uh, spotted salamander larva, another spotted salamander larva. And uh, finally, they are equal opportunity predators as you can see here with this one uh, diving beetle larva preying upon another. So it's definitely a bug eat bug world out there. And the adult predaceous diving beetles are uh, aggressive predators just as the larvae are, as you can see here with this threesome arguing over some uh, undefined leftover. Now, like many aquatic beetles and bugs, they can bite, so handle them with care. The water scorpions aren't scorpions at all and don't bite or sting unless you're their food. Their long tail that, that is at the upper left uh, isn't a stinger at all, but is actually a breathing tube they use at the water surface. And they are true bugs like the water boatmen and back swimmers. 
And despite their appearance, they're only very distantly related to praying mantises, but they do use a similar method of catching their prey as they're both so-called ambush predators. That is, they wait for their prey to meander by and then grasp them with their forelegs, which they hold at the ready. In case of the water scorpions, of course, this all happens underwater. And in this video, short video, you'll see two water scorpions waiting for a meal on the submerged stone. You can see how they're holding their forelegs ready to snatch somebody. And I love this shot, which uh, my wife Zoe took, because it reminds me of our pack of dogs at home staring at us while waiting for a treat. And this one, this uh, water scorpion has finally captured a meal and started feeding. Whoops, that's, nope. Uh, damselflies and dragonflies can also overwinter under the ice as larvae as can be seen with this damselfly nymph. And you can tell this is a damselfly because it has feathery gill gills at its rear end at the upper right that it uses to breathe underwater and because its round eyes are on the sides of its head and don't touch in the middle. Compare that to this dragonfly in which you can actually see the eyes touching. Uh, and in this short clip, you can see a damselfly larva slowly crawling on a plant stem. And again, notice the feathery gills at its rear. Both nymphs and adults of damselflies and dragonflies are predatory. The adults, of course, catch their meals on the wing while nymphs tend to be watch and wait predators. Later in the spring, both damselfly and dragonfly nymphs crawl out of the water and emerge, leaving behind their cast off outer skin or so-called exuvia. Uh, and initially their wings are tiny and can take several hours to expand to their full adult size. And this is an, a, uh, an adult dragonfly with its wings almost fully expanded. Their wings uh, can also be used to differentiate between dragonflies and damselflies. As you can see with this pair of mating damselflies, their wings are generally held together over their backs. In contrast, dragonflies, when at rest, hold their wings horizontally like the wings of an airplane. Now it turns out there are some species of dragonfly just to complicate things, which like damselflies have eye, have, that have eyes that don't touch on the top of their head. But if you combine the wing and eye differences, uh, you'll do well in distinguishing them. And at long last, we come to the giant water bug. They are among the largest true bugs in the world and can apparently deliver a very painful bite, hence their common name, toe biter. So be very careful in handling them or just don't handle them at all. In fact, uh, ever since we discovered that they live at our pond, my wife has taken to wearing water shoes whenever she goes into the pond. Now, interestingly, it's the male giant water bug who cares for the eggs, carrying a hundred or so of them on his back until they hatch. They are predatory, able to catch small fish up to several inches long and have even been reported to catch small birds. However, what goes around comes around, they say, because apparently they're quite tasty and can be found by the basketful in certain Asian markets. And I'd like to end with a shout out for winter. Not only is it great for winter sports like snowshoeing, ice skating or skiing, but it also provides a wonderful opportunity to explore nature at a time when it doesn't have the obvious beauty of a brilliantly colored songbird, but can have a more subtle beauty that can be just as rewarding to discover. So get out there and explore. Thank you. And if there are uh, any questions at this point, I guess we can take perhaps the, uh, the chat questions first. Sure. Thank you, Edwin. That was so inspiring. I just learned a ton. I was jotting down a million notes. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> we do have, um, let's see, well, we'll start with the chat box and then I think one person has their hand raised. We also have a lot of praise for you in the chat box as you might be able to see yourself. Um, Thanks. So let's see. There was a question from Sally. Um, 
caddis fly larvae, do they have lungs or gills? And wow, cold water does not hold much oxygen, I guess is also a question. Does, does cold water hold much oxygen? Okay, two, two really good questions. Um, I can't go back to, to show you, but in, in a couple of shots, you can actually see, uh, I think it was in the one where the uh, caddis fly larva was kind of waving out of, when it was thawing out of the ice. Yeah. You can actually see that it has uh, these tiny feathery gills along uh, its side. They're hard to see, especially since most of the caddis fly larva is in its little case. Um, but if they do stretch out, which they will sometimes, you can actually see the little feathery gills. Uh, and interestingly, uh, it is the cold water that holds more oxygen, uh, which is uh, part of why the uh, colder waters in the ocean, the oceanic colder waters tend to be uh, more, uh, have more uh, sea life in them because they can support more. So really warm waters tend to be more oxygen deficient. Interesting. Um, and when we had a question from uh, Derek there in two parts, uh, one was inquiring about your uh, camera setup and your equipment and what that might look like. Uh, I guess maybe you could describe it or maybe we could share some videos or um, pictures in the follow-up email. And then Derek was reminiscing about collecting um, frog eggs as a kid and was wondering if there was any environmental considerations for collecting some of the eggs this spring to observe their metamorphosis from home. Oh, and... Uh, there there's the equipment. Yeah, so right. So actually there are a couple things. Um, if you want to do something like this, it is a lot of fun, but um, you want to be prepared. The first day that I went out, uh, I didn't have the neoprene. I didn't have the long gloves. And after uh, lying on the ice for maybe 10 minutes, uh, I was actually stuck to the ice. Uh, and, and then my, my arm was basically like a block of wood. I mean, it, 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 you get cold really fast. <laughs> so you need something to protect yourself. Uh, and then in terms of the, the equipment, it's a kind of a cobbled together uh, bit of uh, underwater lights and a, a camera and then a, a long pole because you got to stick your arm in there and you want as much extension as you can get. The camera itself is uh, out of date. Uh, it was, it's a really just a little point and shoot, but it takes great underwater close-up photographs. It's an Olympus. This one's an Olympus TG3. The newest version I think is a TG6. Uh, it's a, you know, a nice little pocket size camera. Um, and then I guess your other question was, oh, about taking uh, eggs. So I have done that a, a few times and um, there are a couple things to be aware of. One is if you do take them out of the pond, they will probably mature faster in your house because it's warmer temperature and all of these processes are gonna be temperature dependent. Um, so they'll, they will probably mature faster uh, in your house, uh, and uh, which can complicate returning them to your pond because they're going to be kind of warm in your house, and then you're going to be putting them back, hopefully, uh, to the pond that they came from, but it's going to be colder. So you might try doing staging it so they're in the house, and then you bring them outside where it's cold for a little bit before just you know, dumping them back into their icy cold pond. But I have done that and it, it can be, the, the shots that I took of the uh, tadpole developing in its eggs, I actually did that at the pond itself, but I have brought them into the house uh, to observe their development too. I mean, it, it's a lot easier obviously in your house, but just to be aware of those other issues or potential issues. Thanks, Edwin. That's great. We have a couple more um, questions in the chat box and then maybe we can do those first and then um, two people have their hands raised at this point. Um, 
so one of the questions is, do you have any images of peeper egg masses? Um, and they say, I have seen other egg masses, but not sure I would recognize peeper eggs. And then a, another question from another participant is, do you ever observe any reptiles? <laughs> so that person was very observant that I mentioned the peeper eggs, but didn't show any peeper eggs. <laughs> and uh, believe me, if I had, if I ever find some, I will, I will uh, take photos of them, but they are, um, they're not as obvious. Um, they are, uh, from what I've seen, they're in single strings and they tend to be hidden. That is, they're on the bottom, uh, they're often under leaves or other debris. So unfortunately, I have not seen them. I, I, but I, I look forward to the day when I, when I do. And uh, the other, what was the other part of the question? Um, do you ever see any reptiles, I think was. Yes, okay. Uh, so the only reptiles we've seen at this pond have been a couple of snapping turtles over the years, but they do not live at the pond. Um, a little background about the pond. Uh, it's actually an artificial pond. It was probably dug maybe, maybe 35 years ago by uh, the previous owners here. Um, it's kind of wild now, uh, but, uh, and 25 years ago when we moved here, the previous, again, the previous owners had actually stocked it with fish. Uh, the fish did not survive a, a particularly hot summer uh, because it's not a really deep pond. And I think it just became too warm for them. Um, so no, no resident um, reptiles at the pond. We do periodically have mergansers and other, other waterfowl who will uh, take up temporary residence. And of course the mergansers uh, will be predatory upon whatever that they can catch in the pond. Awesome. Um, Edwin, I have a quick question and then we can check, scan, like scan the chat box again, see if there are any questions. Um, and then maybe we can move on to the raised hands if that sounds good to you. Um, sure. uh, how big do the water bugs get? <laughs> uh, the, um, the, oh, sorry, the, the giant, um, the, the last one that you showed, the giant ones. Yeah, the, the toe biters. <laughs> yes. Um, so they can, I think the largest one that I've seen here is one, I'd say about three inches long. Um, uh, I think probably four inches is the maximum. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's don't hold me to that, but they are, they can be very big. And if you, a toe. Yeah, exactly. Well, let me see if I can zoom back to, uh, no, it may not let me go back that far. I think I'll be wearing water shoes from now on. In the exactly. <laughs> Edwin, I think I mean, your you, wife you, might be onto something there. Yeah. If you look at their, the, their claws up front, I mean, they really are impressive predators. You can just imagine that thing latching onto your big toe. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you for answering that. Um, let's see. So we have two hands in the chat box. So I think I will. Um, the first one we have here is David. So I'm going to allow you to talk if you had intentionally raised your hand. And I, think I, did, I, I was asking uh, also in the chat uh, if we might get uh, Edwin's contact information. Sure. Um, I can give you my, um, I wonder if I can, if there's some way I can. And well, yeah, I can I, also send it in a follow-up email. If, if you uh, um, send me the good. contact information you want to be dispersed. That would be, be great. I'd, I'd love to get you sure. to do that, a program that would, be, that would be the easiest thing to do. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Edwin. Hi. Hi. Um, this is Betsy. I'm a Betsy. biologist. And for people that don't know about these uh, critters that are on the photo right now, you might describe the mouth parts, that it's a true bug, so it's stabbing. Right. Well, you know, um, 
I'm going to defer to the true bio or to the biologist here. <laughs> I mean, you may you probably know more about the anatomy of uh, uh, the bugs than I do. No, no, I don't. But I just know that, that that's one of the issues with the, the this particular insect. Right. Yeah. It's, so it's uh, insects stabbing, now, not grabbing and chewing; yeah. they're stabbing. And exactly. So yeah. this, uh, is, this is Dave. Dave again. The I'm also a biologist. The the mouth parts are held against the length of its of its belly, and it's it's a piercing like a, a pencil. Type of mouth part that uh, the, they use their claws to hold on to the prey, a small fish or whatever it is, and then they'll pierce it with their mouth parts. Great, yeah. So, so um, the uh, the different insects that you've seen here um, have uh, different types of mouth parts. So, right. the predatory ones tend to have you know stabbing and sucking because they're going to be sucking the, literally the juices out of the, or the digestive, digested uh, insides of their prey. Uh, and then there are um, some of the other bugs like the water boatman, which is a plant eater. And that's, those are going to be more chewing mouth parts. So insects have a, quite a variety of, of mouth parts. And, and, and as another sort of interesting aside, the mouth parts of the juveniles, that is the, the um, larva, may be different from the, the adults. So, you know, depending upon what the, the food type the larva uh, uh, eats, if it's different, you know, if you have a larva that's a plant eater, an adult that's a predator, uh, or an adult that doesn't eat anything at all. And there are some insects that, that, that the adult phase uh, uh, eats nothing, and they they may have uh, very rudimentary mouth parts. So it's really it, they're, they're the insects are a really interesting bunch of critters to 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 learn about. This is, this has been a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. I'm glad you I'm glad you made it. <laughs> Me too. Thank you, David and Betsy. So we have another hand um, up, Lenza has her hand up if you would like to speak now. I will um, get that ready for you. Hi, Lenza. Hi, I have my seven-year-old here who has a question. Oh, comment. I've seen a snake swallow a spotted salamander. Snakes are, was this at your house or were you somewhere else? At my house. That's you. You were very lucky to see that. Um, and uh, you know, snakes are pretty amazing as well. Um, you know, they're often able to eat prey that you can't imagine how they get that something that big into their little mouths. But they, uh, a lot of the snakes can can you know their their jaws and skulls actually can move in ways that ours can't so that they can, they can, uh, they can actually swallow these uh, large prey items. Um, do you, it was a spotted salamander you said? Yes. Yeah, well, snakes have to eat too. <laughs> and um, do you have a pond at your house or some water source that, that the salamander was going to? I have a... Big bog back. Nice. We a, well, yeah, I, we have a big bog. I bet you have a lot of interesting critters uh, in that bog. You know, uh, reptiles, amphibians, bugs, birds, mammals, you, you name it. You've probably got it all. I've seen a eagle. I've seen footprints of a coyote. Very nice. Eaters, lots of... Lots of things. Lots of things. This was really cool because now we can try to at least identify those little creatures in the water. Yeah, and you know, the, 
they're only little because we're big. And if you have yeah. the appropriate way of, of viewing them, uh, they're, they really can be fascinating. I mean, you know, some of these, uh, like uh, David and I'm sorry, I can't remember the, the other biologist's name, but as they mentioned, um, you know, their mouth parts can be very interesting and in all of their parts, you get, get a nice hand lens and it's another whole, whole nother world out there. We, we haven't seen any of these toe biters, but we don't want to, you can keep them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. And, and thank you um, for your son for joining on too. Yeah. Um, I found another question in the Q&A box, um, which I wasn't keeping as close a tab on. I forgot we had that. But um, it is, let's see, what distinguishes a pond from a lake? Is toddy pond a pond? Oh, you know. My wife and I had this discussion a couple of years ago and we came up with about 20 different names. These were uh, you know, the names we made up for different kinds of ponds because we could never figure out what the difference was between a pond. I mean, toddy, why is toddy pond a pond? Um, and I don't know the technical answer, but there is uh, some technical difference and it has to do with depth of the body of water and area but they're really honestly there's a uh, I think there's a big gray area between lakes and ponds you kind of think okay a lake's got to be bigger than a pond but you look at Jordan Pond on uh, Mount Mount Desert that's a pretty big pond you look at our little pond, it's teeny tiny. Um, and there clearly are some uh, bodies of water that are called lakes around here that are smaller, at least in surface area than, than some ponds. So I, I, I don't think there's a, uh, even though I think there is a definition out there, it's not very rigorous. <laughs> Thanks, Edwin. We need, we need a, an aquatic biologist to clarify this. Uh, Marjorie in the chat box says, I was told it has to do with the bottom. Muddy bottoms are ponds and sandy or rock bottoms are lakes. Large ponds are called great ponds. Wow. So a muddy bottom, well, you know, how do they even know that what's the bottom of Jordan Pond? I think it's the third deepest pond or body of water in Maine. Anyway, I, I, I will take that and uh, repeat it. <laughs> so muddy bottom equals pond. What if you have a tiny body of water that has a rocky bottom? It's a little lake. <laughs> <laughs> Edwin, I just wanna take a, a moment to, uh, in case it wasn't highlighted yet, there's been a lot of praise specifically for your photography. Mm -hmm. And I agree, it's, it's wonderful. It's been such a great visual aid. Well, thank you. It was it was uh, it was a lot of fun making this. It it probably you know the video. It's the video portion itself is I think maybe twenty minutes, and it probably took uh, between you know actually filming it and editing it. It probably took a hundred hours. <laughs> you know, so it's it's. Uh, there's a lot, you know, that we don't, there's, people don't use film anymore, but the, 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 the saying is there's a lot of film on the cutting floor. A lot, a lot of stuff is thrown out. <laughs> yes. But I learned a lot doing it. It was, it was fun for sure. That's Opened wonderful. my eyes. Yeah, it's been a, a huge, huge pleasure to have you here tonight, Edwin, and to see your, your beautiful images and to be learning well, from you. Much. And I know we're, we're, we're just about to hit 5 p.m. We're about to hit the hour, but if anyone else has any last minute questions you wanna put in the chat box or raise your hand, feel free to do that. And we will be sending a follow-up email probably sometime early next week with the recording and I'll include contact information for Edwin. Um, and so you will be receiving that soon. 
And thank you everyone Great. in the well, audience too for, for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you all for, uh, for showing up and thank uh, you Lander and Jake for hosting this. Our pleasure. A lot of fun. Absolutely. And yeah, I'll, um, well, you, you have my email, so uh, you can uh, uh, distribute that to some people who are interested. Okay, awesome. Do you mind if I put it in the follow-up email? No, that's okay. fine. Cool. I will, I will do that then. And we're getting a lot of thanks in the chat box. Hopefully you can see that, Edwin. Thank you all so much. And we hope you have a great, a great night and hope to see you again for another Friends from the Field webinar at some point. All right, have a good night. Thanks very much. Thanks, Edwin. All right, bye, bye. everybody. Night, Lander. Bye, Jake.